Pet Cemetery. The owners buried their 18-year-old dog in a similar place not far from one of the Russian villages. He'd been sick for a long time, so people were prepared for his death. But just a few hours later, the dog was found near one of the roads, alive. <laughs> Zombies? I mean, sure, I get that they are popular characters for horror movies, but they don't exist. You can't bring back to life someone who's already dead. <laughs> but it's actually a little bit more complicated than it seems. Unlike in the human world, zombies aren't part of horror movies in the animal world. Perhaps because animals don't have movies? But zombies are real, and they can even be divided into levels. The easiest one is the zombie costume. I'm not kidding. The assassin bug, Acanthopsis petax, kills its victims, then wears their remains on itself, literally pretending to be other insects. The shell, made of its victims, is much larger than the body of the bug and can contain up to 20 exoskeletons of ants. This is how Acanthospis petax defends itself against its main enemies, spiders. Spiders mistake the shell of exoskeletons for a group of live ants and they prefer not to get involved, perhaps because the ants resist when spiders try to eat them. Or maybe spiders just don't like zombies. Even if it's just a costume, that's where it usually starts. You're not zombies at all. And you aren't soul-sucking cat people. And it's getting better. Because tongue-eating lice haven't just learned to pretend, they actually replace the tongue of the fish they live in and control it? The tiny crustacean enters the fish's body through the gills, digs into the tongue, and sucks all the blood out of it until the tongue falls off. Literally, the parasite then has only to attach itself to the remaining muscles to feed on the victim's blood and mucus, performing all the functions of the eaten organ in return. That's terrible, you might think. But fish are unlikely to agree, first because they're fish and don't understand what I'm saying, and second, well, fish don't feel any discomfort. They probably don't even realize that instead of tongues, they now have lice. Because fish don't really need their tongues. Unlike mammals, it doesn't participate in the process of chewing food. It just pushes the food down the esophagus. A lice can do it too. Not the hardest job in the world. Yes, the parasite makes the fish a little thinner. It can theoretically grow too big and completely block fish's throat, but its maximum discomfort would be having a lisp. If the fish could talk. Why? Why are you looking at me? Is there something on my face? But if these are the light versions of zombification, then the next level is when the full body control begins. There are quite a few creatures who practice it, and more often than not, zombies roam the insect world, but there are unique and very frightening cases. Once some not-so-cautious little fish pick up a fluke, the fish begin to swim to the surface, even flipping around to attract attention. So the fish become a conspicuous target and end up being eaten by birds. And that's all the fluke needed. It simply hitched a ride and, yes, the fluke sent the fish to its death. The same thing happens to rats and mice, which aren't afraid of cats. The tiny parasite, Toxoplasma gondi, enters the rodent's body with food and controls the actions of its host. This way, the rodent isn't afraid of cats. Moreover, rats and mice begin to look for their main enemies and die. The parasite enters the cat's body and begins to multiply already inside of it, because it's the most comfortable environment for the Toxoplasma gondi. This is how its happy ending looks like. But how can you even hack someone else's brain when you're so tiny that it takes a microscope to even see you? Blood comes into play. First, the parasite enters it, then it spreads throughout the body, and for one purpose only, to get to the brain and completely reprogram it. No antivirus can help here. It takes seven to 10 days for the parasite to take over the body. As a rule, nothing happens during this time, and the infected animal has no idea that it's about to turn into a zombie. And is it really possible to resist this? What can one do in such a situation? Arm oneself with something, like in the movies? Yeah, I don't think that would help. In most cases, zombification at this level ends in the death of the victim. To survive a takeover of one's body, one would have to be, I don't know, a ladybug, I guess? Because these guys are the ones who can really get rid of the zombie parasite. When Dinocampus coccinelli females place their eggs in the bodies of ladybugs, the latter don't even realize that anything has happened. They continue to hunt the aphids for the next three weeks until the larva grows enough to get out. And we could insert shots from Alien somewhere in here. Dallas? 
But the parasite still needs the ladybug. Squeezes through a crack in the bug's shell, gets out, and starts weaving a silk cocoon right under the bug's belly. But only the body, not the brain, is freed from the invader. The zombified ladybug, when a predator approaches, starts jerking its paws and serves to scare it away. You could say that a bug for a larva is the same thing as the Terminator for John Connor. Your clothes. Give them to me. No. And yes, only about 25% of ladybugs can survive after the larva turns into an adult insect and flies away. I have no idea how they do survive, though. But scientists have figured out why the creatures take over the brains of others in the first place. I mean, they couldn't just want to turn a rat into a zombie one day. Hey, Steve, Steve, listen, I just had a genius idea. Let's hijack a rat. It's an incredibly complicated process, like if a human was enslaved by, I don't know, an ant. Can you imagine how hard it would have to try? But as usual, it's all about genes and the desire to continue the species. If insects and other protozoans have to use bodies of other creatures in order to reproduce successfully, they will pump up this ability until they perfect zombification. It's a question of the survival of the species, and for the sake of it, they can do anything, even evolve in a special way. And then I thought, can an animal not get the zombie virus but be born with it right away? Sounds like complete nonsense. Even in the movies, the number of zombies grows in a different way. But then I came across prions. Basically, they are proteins with an unusual structure, which makes prions deadly. You may have heard that there were some strange cases in the US and Canada. The deer and elk behaved as they were the characters of The Walking Dead. The animals who had contracted some strange disease lost their fear of humans, behaved aggressively, had difficulty moving, lowered their heads, trembled. Ring any bells? It turned out that the prions were to blame, and they can be found in many species, including the human body. Up to a certain point, the protein can behave perfectly and be called PRPC. But then it turns to the dark side and becomes PRPSC. Learn to use the dark side of the force. And this is the beginning of the end. There's no cure for prion diseases, and prions themselves are dangerous because they can survive for years in the wild, in the soil in tree roots, and even on rocks. It is not known what exactly causes the mutation, nor is it clear why it exists in the first place. Any organism infected with one of the prion diseases is doomed to die. So what's the point? Yes, they can be transmitted from one creature to another, but it's not like we're talking about procreation here. <sighs> Prions don't seem to have any purpose at all, only the way. This is the way. This is the way. As I said before, prions are damn resilient. They can only be destroyed by very high temperatures of about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, combined with super powerful detergents, and the cleaning must last at least 20 minutes. So we have proteins in our bodies that can mutate at any time and cause terrible diseases? The same ones that turn deer into zombies? And yet we have no idea how to deal with it. Does it mean that we could become zombies ourselves? Okay, I think it's time to start panicking. But not for very long, because in reality, zombie apocalypse is unlikely to come, no matter how hard that prions try. Once the walking dead appear, nature will show them who's boss. Bears, scavenger birds, and even meat flies will be very happy to have an unexpected buffet with delivery to every part of the planet, not to mention the bacteria, mold, and various fungi that will immediately join the fight against the zombies. It's unlikely that the army of the dead will last longer than a week. All people will have to do is lock themselves away somewhere and wait. Exhale. Phew. Oh, and by the way, what about the dog that rose from the grave? Nothing paranormal. The elderly dog had fallen too soundly asleep, the owners failed to wake him up, and came to a logical conclusion. The grave was shallow, so the pet managed to get out and go out on the road, where he was picked up by volunteers. He was returned to his family the very next day. See you later.